You are listening to the ODAT Chat Podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Thank you for downloading the podcast. My name is Arlena and I'll be your host. Today, my guest is Meg Love, who grew up the daughter of a preacher. Meg shares a traumatic childhood event that led to addiction and an abusive relationship, all of which nearly cost her her life. But this is a story of hope and triumph. Meg has survived some pretty awful situations, and yet she has taken charge of her life and had that complete psychic change that the big book talks about. Now she has a life she loves. She is an absolute miracle. She's also got a wicked sense of humor and a heart of gold. If you would like to hear more episodes like this one, along with book recommendations, meditations, and all kinds of other resources, just visit odatchat.com and subscribe to the weekly newsletter. So there you have it. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Meg. Well, Meg, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chat podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. So excited to have you here. I thought we would start out. I was doing these uh, lightning rounds at the ends of the interview, but I found that it's a great way to sort of warm up. So you want to play along with the lightning round? Yeah, let's do that. Or whatever the hell that is. <laughs> and you have no warning. No warning about what this is. But this is easy. Um, so what's okay. your favorite recovery book? Um, probably the one, of course, that I can't remember the name to, and it's all these famous people with their stories. And I think that Mm. it's called, shall we circle back? Yeah, let's go back to that one. Okay. We'll circle back. Favorite recovery book. Okay. Um, do you have a go-to mantra or quote that you live by? Mm, Okay. My honestly, yeah, probably be the person you needed when you were younger. Be the and person like when, you needed when you were younger. And it applies to almost any situation because like even 10 minutes ago, I was younger than I am now. So like just be who I needed someone to be for me and I probably won't be doing harm. That is awesome. Um, well, this is kind of funny that you say that because the next question is, uh, what's one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober? It's kind of your younger self, right? Yeah, no kidding. Um... I think that I wish that I would have known that it's a blessing when I don't get what I pray for. <gasps> Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. It's a blessing. That's a good one. Do you have a regular, like a daily self-care recovery routine or is it more of a weekly routine? What's your self-care it's definitely daily, although it varies sometimes daily. Um, I'm really fortunate that I have a group of women in my life that mm-hmm. we have like a group chat and one oh. of them posts, um, first thing in the morning, like readings from multiple different like daily devotionals and reflections. And so usually that's like the first thing that I see when I touch my phone, but I try to the best of my ability to pray before I even get out of bed. Like, pray before, before I, I even interact with the world. Let me get out of my own headspace. I love it. Okay. What, um, what's your, what's your higher power look like? What's your concept Mm. of your higher power? It's ever evolving. Um, I Mm. use the term God out of easiness and versatility. Um, but honestly, I think my most accurate description of what I think my higher power might be like is Awa from Avatar. (laughs) That's my actual truth. (laughs) Girl, I (laughs) totally get it. An energy that is everywhere. Um, I don't picture like it's not my parents' conception of God. Um, it's not my childhood conception of God. If I had to guess, it seems like it would make more sense that it's female, but it's everywhere. It shows up in almost everything. And like when I feel it, it's like those little fluffy things that land on trees. And I'm like, oh, I'm in my God space. <laughs> Okay, so favorite movie ever. I love that movie, Avatar. I've seen it a thousand times. Yeah, so it's so interesting that you mentioned that there is like this feminine element to your higher power. Uh, I remember when I first, I grew up in a traditional like Christian home where it was like Father God, Man in the Sky, you know, you ascend to heaven, yes. you know, all that kind of thing. 
And it was like, yeah, that doesn't really make sense, you know? And then I asked somebody that I really respect and she's like, well, I think of it as like Father God, Mother Earth, you know? It's like, and then um, Carolyn Miss or Mace, I don't know how to say her last name. She talked about um, God being law, but personal. And so that kind of still fits like that male, female idea. Like it's both, it's all things um, in my mind, but it's so interesting that it is always sort of evolving, isn't it? It sure is. And I'm grateful that that's one of the things that I was given permission for in recovery. Oh, yeah. That I didn't have to, like, make a one-time commitment, sign on, this is the deal, you know, otherwise I never would have been able to agree. But just, like, what I think it is right now is good enough and I can rearrange it later. Yeah, permission to start where you are. Start Mm -hmm. over. Man, I had a sponsor be like, you know, um, write down all the things you wish God was, you know, all the, all the things are like good things and bad things, or what do you think it is? And, um, I, you know, made the two columns and then she tore it in half and handed me all the good things, you know, God is love, peaceful, omnipresent, omnipotent, um, love and kindness. So that's very cool. Did you grow up in the church? Yeah. I'm the kid of a pastor. Um, (gasps) Yeah. Um, I grew up super churched. Um, definitely some good things came out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, in my more wild years, I would tell anyone that would listen that I have religious trauma. So don't talk to me about God. God mm-hmm. and I are not friends right now. Mm. Um, and so it took a lot of rescripting to figure out what I was going to be able to work with. That is amazing. Man, I remember I, I was super church too. That's funny that you put it that way. I grew up with, I grew up with a Southern Baptist. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of extreme. And the pastor's daughter, I, she was my idol. She was a heavy weed smoker. And she told me one time, Arlena, I am high so often that not being high is my altered reality. And I was like, oh, I want to be just like you when I grow up. (laughs) Yeah. I thought that was amazing. Why do you think it's the pastor's daughters, the pastor's kids that have such a hard time? I don't know. I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and debating it. Um, you know, because like I think that absolutely played into mostly the things that I told myself. Um, you know, and like having such a black and white, like laid out description of, I mean, of literally eternity. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was not a lot of wiggle room. And like for a kid who grew up feeling um, like just so different just so separate, different, and alone. Um, That idea of God was really, really intimidating to me. Um, And then, you know, like when your family and your church and all of that is so intertwined, when one piece um, fails you, then all the parts fall apart. Yeah. And that was sort of the beginning of of, of my demise with drugs and alcohol. I feel like this trying to, be held to this standard that's like inhuman, you know, mm-hmm. and a constant reminder that you're failing, you know, creates this cycle of shame. It's like this world of perfectionism, you know, and not being able to fail without like heavy consequences. Like you're the pastor's daughter. You're supposed to be like this example. I would imagine, you know, that uh, it doesn't really allow for you to be vulnerable and be honest and have the courage to just be like, I hate this. I hate all of it. I hate myself. You know, it's not, not a lot yeah. of room for truth. Well, and there was like um, a lot of like, regardless of what you did, there was like this constant condemnation. <laughs> you know, there wasn't really like much of a lifeline in what I heard. And one thing like I've absolutely learned in my sobriety is that how I remember things is not necessarily how it happened. Oh yeah. And what I heard is not necessarily what people were trying to say. So like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm one of four kids. My siblings are all, we're all within like 18 months to two years of each other. Um, and like, we have very, very different recollections and memories wow. of our childhood. Um, you know, and so realizing that like what I heard, what I thought was going on was not everyone's experience, but like I felt very, very hopeless and very worthless oftentimes in, in the idea of God that I got as a kid. Isn't that crazy how... You know, we, looking back, our, our memories are so different. Like I have an older sister and she and I, even to this day, can be standing shoulder to shoulder witnessing a scene. 
and the stories we tell about what happened are like day and night. Yeah. Our perspectives are so different. It's just so crazy. And there's some interesting, um, have you ever seen that Netflix series about, about the mind, about the brain? Gosh, I, I think it's called the mind explained. I don't think so. Oh my God. It's totally, it's totally worth your time to check it out. They, they talk about how we, um, like re- revisionist history. It's like, oh, our, mm-hmm. like we mentally can't, like we think we remember something a certain way and then they go back and, and do a little like this, for instance, this one girl remembered nine 11. She remembered being in school and hearing the news. And then she was like in New York and she said that she was looking at her window and there was the water and she could see the smoke from the buildings. Well, they did a little analytical you know, investigation. And they realized, oh, well, she was in this place on the map. And there was no physical way that she could have seen the smoke come from. But in her mind, it was like, so vivid, like that actually happened. Oh, how cute we have a kitty. (laughs) For those of you uh, watching, (laughs) listening on the uh, podcast, we're publishing the video, by the way, I hope you're okay with that. (laughs) Um, Yeah, we talked about that, right? Okay. Yeah. So little kitty just made an appearance super cute but it's just kind of interesting though the revisionist history and i think it's they talk about how it's based off of our feelings like how we felt about a thing and then our our brains like fill in the gaps mm-hmm. so it's interesting yeah, the first time that i kind of heard that concept um was when i was in um in treatment Mm-hmm. And um, they brought up this idea of like our memories not being totally factual yeah. and that we fill in the gaps and based on feelings. And I remember how terrifying that felt because I needed to be right. <gasps> I needed Ooh. my account to be the end all be all. I needed it to be fact. Like I could not lose that little tiny sense of like what I was holding on to, the things I was angry about, the things that drove my fears. There was at that point no room at all for the possibility that I was not right. And so like now being at a place years later, um, what I what I what I think is true and what I believe I'm being honest about to the best of my ability today may look different down the road. Amen to that. It doesn't feel- make me a liar. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I think it's, uh, you know, underneath that is this need to have our feelings validated, mm-hmm. right? Like we all, we all need to be seen and heard and understood, you know? And it's like, we need, you know, that need to be right is often a need to be validated that our pain was valid. Right. But, uh, yeah. I could talk to you forever. I can see where this is going. I'm going to have to like <laughs> rein it in a little bit uh, because Mark, who is the one who introduced us, shout out to Mark. Hey, hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Um, he's going to be like, oh, you need to have her tell her story. And so we got little bits and pieces. But what I typically do is I'll just give you some time to sort of tell your story. I'd love to hear your story, uh, pastor's daughter who ends up in rehab and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. very salacious. <laughs> But I'll just give you a few minutes uninterrupted, and then uh, well, I have a whole bunch of questions. Off limits. You want mm-hmm. the truth, right? Yeah, get, I'll give it up, girl. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that um, let me start by saying true things. I'm sober now. <laughs> I've been in a place where I have not had to put a mind-altering drink or drug in my body since November 12th of 2017. That in this person's life is a miracle. Um, So what led up to that point? Um, You know, I used to think that the first time that I started drinking and using was when I was 14. And like talking about, you know, our version of the truth. That was what I really believed was the first time that like I found substances. Um, And I realized that the first time that I ever, ever touched drugs was um, that I stole my brother's Ritalin. And he had ADHD. Um, My parents often reference, like, did he take his meds? You know, like, whatever he was acting out, there was, like, in my mind, um, at, like, 12 or 13, there was this magic pill that could make even my brother normal. And this constant feeling of not being right, of not being like other people, um, it was really a curiosity thing. Like, maybe this pill will make me normal, too. Um, And I took it and I stayed up for like two days and I absolutely loved it. I loved being alone. I loved not having anyone tell me what to do at night. I loved feeling different. 
Um, and you know, and that was sort of like what it was and that was it. And then, um, you know, about a year later, um, I was sexually assaulted by a family member and, um, and I did every drug I've ever done in the year following that event. Um, and, you know, talking about like church and God and family, because everything was so intertwined when that happened, um, then all of my ties to what was supposed to be sort of crumbled. And so I was 14 then at that point, did everything I could to escape me. Um, and that went on through like the three years of high school. Um, I started to realize I was headed down a path that like mostly got me consequences. Um, I think part of it's faster kid. I don't like being in trouble. I don't like being yelled at. I don't like being told what to do. So like my desire to behave is not because I agree, but because I really don't like being embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And so like, as I got older, I didn't like failing classes. I didn't like constantly being in trouble. I didn't want to end up a person that was basically called out. Um, so I did like the super alcoholic thing and I moved to Connecticut from Lowell, Oregon. <laughs> so I took a live in nanny job um, with a family in Connecticut, moved to the East Coast at 19 and figured that if I was somewhere else, I would be someone else. Um, and like, and that worked. That really did work for a period of time. Um, I met the person that I married and stayed married to for 11 years. Um, and during that 11 years, he was my addiction. So I was able to focus and obsess and not be in my own body or my own head by taking care of a person who was an abusive addict. Um, it was not until I got out of that that um, I finally felt like I had permission to be whatever I wanted. I had three kids. I was 31 years old. I moved back to Oregon. Um, and for the first time in my life, lived in my own place. Um, I was not the pastor's kid. I was not anybody's wife. I could do whatever I wanted. And it turns out that all I wanted to do was self-medicate. Yeah. Um, and I found the people that I used to be with in high school. Um, I found the drugs that had had the greatest impact. Um, and I just picked back up where I had left off and went hard. And it was not, um, you know, I could never, when they talk about this all the time, I could never recapture the relief that I felt. And so like that need for more and more and more um, was literally like unstoppable. And it pretty quickly, and like I managed, I was still holding a job um, from the outside. A lot of people were still like complimenting me. Um, you know, I was thinner than I'd ever been. I was super productive. Meth has that effect on people at first. <laughs> at first. Um, at first, you know, and so it looked like I was doing okay. And, um, and that was a dangerous place to be because I was not. And it became apparent to me before it became apparent to other people um, that like I was absolutely drinking and using against my will. Like I could not, not get high. Um, and it got to a point that I literally was too scared to leave my house. I couldn't go outside. I could not show up for work. And that's basically when I blew the whistle on myself. Um, I absolutely was more willing to believe that I had, um, like a severe mental health diagnosis. Like I'm psychotic, put me somewhere, give me more pills and I'll be okay. Um, you know, the blessing is that I was finally in a place that I was willing to be honest and like tell someone the actual truth. Um, so when I tried to check myself into, um, like a mental health ward, they said, you're not crazy. You have a drug and alcohol problem. Um, and they sent me to, um, you know, like a local agency for an assessment there. Um, that assessment proved to be like so much more than I ever could have imagined that I was getting into, but I was finally honest and like honest about stuff that I had just been carrying around since like 13 years old. And they said, we don't think that our 28 day program is really going to meet your needs. Of course, all I heard was rejection. Like, who doesn't make the cut for treatment? So devastated that there was like no hope for me. Um, but I ended up getting referred to a um, really trauma informed and focused residential treatment center out of state. So I went to treatment in Texas, um, stayed 90 days, learned so much. Um, 
and absolutely believed that I was going to have like. Oh, I lost your audio. Hold on a second. I can't hear you. Um, I don't know what happened. Can you hear me? You can't hear me? Oh, now I can. Oh, You're there back. you are. Well, that's the last thing you heard. <laughs> uh, you went to trauma-informed therapy uh, rehab for 90 days. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so there, like, I learned a lot. Like, I felt like I understood myself in a way that I hadn't. There was finally some validation. Um, you know, like, I was able to unpack a lot of the garbage. And I really thought, like, this was it. I was going to have one clean date. I was going to move on and be successful. I had held my job through FMLA. Like, I believed I had it beat. Um, and I came home and almost immediately relapsed. Like, I remember getting my you know, like hitting my 90 days and someone texting me like, congratulations on your hundred days. And I was already loaded and I couldn't have told you when. Oh, bummer. Whoops. Frozen again. Oopsies. Is it me? Oh, it might be me. Frozen. Can you still hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, now I can. Do you know what? I'm, I'm going to pause this real quick and change. It might be me. I'm so sorry. Hang I don't on. I don't know if it is. It might be you? It might be. I mean, I don't think anything's happening, but I never know. Okay, me either. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Something goes wrong and we're both like, oh, it's probably me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably my fault. Uh, let me just try changing. Let's see what happens. It's going to make us freeze for a second, so don't panic. Can you still hear me? I can hear you, but you're frozen. Does that seem any better? Oh, here we go. Well, so far so good. Okay, should we give it a whirl? Yeah, I we left off with um, somebody called to congratulate you for a hundred days, and you were already loaded. Okay. Um. And so, yeah, I could not have told you really what happened between 90 and 100 days. Um, I just knew I was right back where I was before I ever went to treatment. Um, and so over the course of basically a four-month relapse, um, I lost the job that I had held through FMLA. I got fired. Um, I got evicted from my place. I ended up totaling my car with all three of my kids in it. And, um, and the consequences were huge. And like fast and the misery was like instant. And um, I realized that like everything that they had told me about me and about addiction was proven to be true. Like everything that they had said to me was playing out. Like if you, if you go back out, this is what it's going to look like. And I realized that like, I did not want to test the final theories. Um, you know, I managed not to be in trouble with the law. Um, I had not even, I somehow avoided consequences in the wreck with my kids. I didn't hit another car. There was um, no legal ramifications, but being evicted, losing my job, um, and realizing that like I was as desperate and unfortunately then psychotic as before I went to treatment, um, that is when I finally became like in a place that I realized that I have zero ability to control this without changing every aspect of my life. Um, I spent a brief amount of time in a homeless shelter here. Um, I finally, and it seems kind of funny when I look back on it, but like in that homeless shelter, um, was finally the first time that I actually prayed about my addiction. Um, I don't know, because I had this God who really needed me to be neat and tidy. I was going to come to God when I had everything fixed to show him what I did. Like, ta-da, I'm not broken anymore. Can I go to heaven? Um, and it was finally at that place of relapse that, like, I'm like, whatever it is that's wrong with me, like, you have to take it out of me because I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. And that is the beginning of, like, when things changed for me. And um, 
I would love to say that like that prayer was also my final clean and sober date. Um, but no, I experimented with some other things, you know, like if I um, used over the counter meds in large proportions, that's not really a relapse, you know, um, things like that. Um, if I abused something I had an actual prescription for, like, does that still count? And I finally um, like realized like, what my innermost self is, what I'm willing to admit I need help with, like has gotten deeper with each relapse. And like me alone with me in a bathroom looks the same regardless of the substance. Yeah. And, um, and you know, like luckily I haven't had to medicate since that last realization. Um, you know, that's been like a little over three years ago. Oh my God. That's amazing. Okay, um, a couple of questions for you. Um, I know that you're currently studying now to be a drug and alcohol counselor. Do I have that right? That's right. I am. So what's the difference between trauma informed, uh, rehab and just like standard run of the mill rehab? I think that trauma informed is really becoming like a catchphrase. Um, and that more and more people are realizing it's important. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that like how it's actually played out, looks really different. And now by no means am I an expert on this. This is just like from a client perspective. From a client like, perspective. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, that like where I went to treatment realized that like until some of that stuff from the past could be looked at, there was absolutely no way that your brain could take in new information. Oh. And like, and I remember like they told me like, you are still running your life based on the hurt feelings of like a 12 year old Megan. How's that working? And like, I couldn't get it at first, but it really became a place that I could um, like examine core beliefs. And yes. like, what are the things that I tell myself about myself that end up with the same results? Um, and, you know, like the, um, the treatment center that I had done my assessment with, um, although super effective, have helped tons of people like in my area. They really pretty much have like a 28 day program it's essentially substance focused um and there's not like just there's just not the capacity or the staffing for looking at all the stuff that led up to the self medicating okay yeah the uh trauma the trauma piece is so important to acknowledge process and resolve so that you can change your beliefs and look yeah. at the world look at yourself differently and how you operate in the world um and I was curious, you were in that for 90 days. Where were your kids? It's, this is one of the things that I hear all the time mm -hmm. is I can't possibly go to rehab. I have kids. But where did your kids go? Um, okay, so my kids were with their biological dad, okay. which sounds like kind of neat and tidy. But like the reality of that is um, I had put a lot of effort into getting out of that marriage. Yeah. We weren't safe. Um, it was... It was the hardest thing I'd ever done it was like literally pack up in the middle of the night and like run from a person who would not let us leave. Oh my God. Um, but a couple of years later, when drugs had completely taken over my life, he was the better option as a parent. And like that sucked. That hurt. That was awful. There was nothing fun in saying like, I need help so bad that I need you to step up. Oh my and God. Um, you know, like things work out the way that they're supposed to. Amazingly, he did. He did. Wow. And I got the help that I needed in that time. So the trauma that you experienced was largely physical and mental abuse from your ex-husband? Yeah. Yeah. And like, it's not talked a lot about, but like financial and emotional. Yeah. Um, I had, I just had zero independence, um, zero access to things. Like you're not allowed a mailbox key or an internet password. Um, I didn't know what our bills were. He, um, you know, and, and like my part, my, you know, like I merged into his life, you know, I moved at 19 to the other side of the country intentionally looking to forget me. And I found a person who I could just absorb into his life. He lived in Queens, New York. He was self-sufficient and I just moved into his apartment and started driving his car and spending his money. And so then like, as I got a job and we got married and stuff, I still did not have any reason to become informed. And then when his addiction became apparent, 
um, and he had a severe opiate addiction. Um, at that point, I wasn't, you know, using. Um, and our life got really scary really fast in terms of like living without utilities for extended periods of time. Oh my goodness. With children? Yes. Yes. In New York when it was freezing? When, like, and we lived in New Jersey at that point. Um, and it was with my older two, which are 18 months apart. When they were babies, it was constantly trying to make up a story about why things were the way that they were. To the kids? Um, yeah. And, like, we would play camping at home. Oh, yeah. And and um, what was, I think, the most hurtful was that I felt so alone in trying to fix it. Mm. Because he was so checked out, um, you know, like, standing in line for food boxes with two little kids to go home to a house that doesn't have power, um, just being humiliated, constantly having our account overdrawn. And, like, that was really the point, like, when I started questioning things, you know, like, why can't I check the mail or who do I call when our power is off um, that, that it really set the stage for just a perfect storm. And he was not willing to let anybody in, including me um, as he got, as he got more angry, my fear for the kids got bigger. And although he was rarely physically abusive, um, you know, like punching walls and, you know, not letting me leave rooms was enough that I just didn't want the kids to get caught in it. And, um, you know, and like the truth is that went on for like another five years. I had a third child. We tried moving to another state. Um, and when we finally made like that other geographical change from New Jersey to Georgia, and I um, was right back in the same situation. I've always worked in healthcare. Um, so, you know, like I worked in hospitals in various states. I've always been able to like be employed and present as though I'm okay. And then going home to this total just chaos and crazy making and, um, you know, like hiding things and then being mad at me for losing them. And, you know, just like the stuff and changing the temperature on the stove and being mad that food was burnt and, you know, turning off alarms and making me late and then making me think I wasn't organized. And it just, it became total insanity. And um, after the birth of my third child is when I started drinking on a daily basis. And so that started before I left him. Um, and then once I left, that just went absolutely like full bore. Wow. So when, so the, uh, so thank God he stepped up and you got to leave the kids with him. Um, that must've been, I mean, talk about willingness and desperation, you know, just wanting to change. Did you have that experience of just want, like being willing to do any, whatever it took to change so that you could, you know, take care of your kids and save yourself? Definitely. Um, there was a point in between having my first assessment done and finding um, the treatment center in Texas that um, I had finally been honest. I could, I, I literally, I couldn't get out of my house. I could not leave. I could not drive. I could not go places. The paranoia and the psychosis was just so horrible. And um, I basically was like, either they need to come up with a bed or I'm going to kill myself. And that was the point where I'm like, something has to change. And um, my world had gotten really, really small by that time. And I had basically three people in my life, my sister, the drug dealer, and the drug dealer's best friend. And I basically took a survey and I'm like, either I have to find someplace safe to be or I'm going to kill myself. And the drug dealer and the drug dealer's friend said, whatever is wrong with you, treatment's not going to fix. Just kill yourself. <gasps> Are you serious? I'm 100% serious. Like, that was on a Thursday. I had a date. We were going to do it on Sunday. I could not do what I was doing. And they're like, whatever is wrong with you, like, no one can fix. And I remember them saying, like, people get perma-tweaked. Sometimes people's brains never come back. Like, you're never going to be better. And I remember talking to my sister, who had already said, like, you are in a spiral that I can't get too close to. But I said like, all right, Kaylee, what do I do? Here's my options. And, um, and she said, if there's any hope for you, go do it. Like get your crazy ass on a plane, go, you know, wherever you need to go and get better. And I remember like thinking, oh no, like the vote is two to one. Two people think I should die and only one person thinks I should live. And the fact that I was sad about that 
was the first realization that I didn't really want to die. Um, and it occurred to me that um, I should get a vote. Like it had not occurred to me that like I should ask me. And so um, I did, I asked me and I thought, I don't, I don't want to die. I don't want to not ever be there for my kids again. And so, um, you know, like realizing that the vote is now two to two. And if it's a tie, I should at least try. And I held on and I was more afraid of killing myself when I was coming down or not high than when I was drunk and loaded. And so I stayed that way. I stayed as intoxicated as possible until I got that call and said, there's a bed. And somehow I managed to book a plane ticket um, and write down the place that I was going and, and get on a plane and I left. And I was determined to at least figure out if I could break the tie. And like, that's really what prompted. And if that meant like, if I'm gonna kill myself, then someone else is gonna have my kids anyways. Like if I'm really ready to just check out, then like, who cares about my car? Who cares about like all these things that were like an obstacle to going to treatment? Um, if I'm willing to just be done, then I'm not going to not go to treatment over those things. And, and I went and I really, really wanted to get well. That's amazing. Oh my God. I wonder, you know, I was going to ask you about your family during all this time. Sounds like hey, your sister's name is Haley. Haley. Haley, she was was she the last one that was in your corner? Yeah. Um yeah, she was. And you know, my parents um I don't think they knew what was going on. They really didn't know how to be there or what they were even seeing. Um and I pretty much quit interacting with them. Okay. Uh, like I said, my world was small. I didn't really have friends. I had a couple of co- co-workers who, um, you know, I thought I would, that no one knew what I was doing and they would make a couple of comments, um, you know, about like, maybe you want to do something different. And my sister um, was married, had um, a child and was like, I can't get too close because I don't know what it is that you're doing, but like, I'm here for you if you ever want to stop. And so when it came to a place that I was willing to maybe do something different, um, you know, she's the one who drove me to the Portland airport. Uh, she's the one who helped me, you know, like find a place to park my car while I was gone. And, um, you know, and she was the last person who was like, you didn't all, you weren't always this way. Like, I think you can find you again. And she was really the last one rooting for me. Yeah. Oh man. Haley, the connoisseur of hope. <laughs> Um, no, that's incredible. I love the thought process though, because as I don't know what it sounds like from the outside anymore, I've lost all perspective of what like normal people think, but, um, (laughs) I understand that. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like we have a new normal and the thought process of I'm going to lose everything anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to lose. Like someone else, if I die, someone else is going to raise my kids. Like if I'm dead, who cares about the car? You know, um, that, that thought process of if I'm going to lose anything, everything anyway, I may as well just try this one thing and see Mm -hmm. if it works, see if I can find. And that's off, you know, there's this idea that you have to be a hundred percent committed. And I would disagree. I would say that the commitment has to be 51% because as long as you're just tipped over in the other direction, there's a chance. Yeah. And that's what I was hearing in your story is like, well, 50-50, 50-50, two votes, right. Right? right? There's two votes and the tiebreaker might as well. I mean, you really right. literally had nothing to lose. The uh, short form of the serenity prayer, which is, fuck it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it helped me know when to say fuck it. <laughs> right. Um, and the other thing I was going to ask you when you were telling your story is, uh, what happened? Did the kids, when you got in the car accident and totaled your car, did the kids get hurt? No, I mean, talk about like some sort of divine protection. And I mean, I don't know. I cannot really explain it. Um, It was only me and them in the car. Um, You know, like at that time, I didn't really consider myself very intoxicated. Um, I mean, I've been way drunker, so I wasn't drunk driving. Um, But we had spent the day at the lake after being on a multiple day run of not sleeping. And in my mind, like I'm going to be a good mom and have a good day with them and take them to the lake. And, um, you know, like 
drank while I was out there. I never, ever not smoked weed, um, you know, but like I hadn't used meth that day and I wasn't with any of my party people. So like in my mind, I was in mom mode and on the way home from the lake, um, I must have fallen asleep. Oh. I, I really don't know, but like um, my oldest was in the front seat next to me. My two younger ones were in the back. One of them was still in the car seat and I crossed over the opposing lane of traffic and into a ditch and hit someone's mailbox and it totaled the car. Um, and it, you know, it shattered the windshield and like, you know, there was definitely like damage done. There was like looking at the car. I mean, because of the way it landed in the ditch, like we couldn't even get out on the passenger doors. So like trying to get the kids out through the driver's side, like through the broken windows, oh my um, you know, and like, and we're in our swimsuits. And I remember kind of having one of those moments of like thinking like, this looks really bad. And, um, you know, where we were kind of at with the lake was rural. Someone called um, 911. And so, like, the local volunteer EMT showed up. And they did a basic check on everyone. There was no other car involved. The guy whose mailbox was hit was not concerned about his property. Um, I had AAA, like a good adult. So they were going to tow my car. And someone came and picked up me and the kids. And I remember they asked me, like, have you been drinking? Um, and I said, no, I've been at the lake with my kids today. Like that was my, you know, like, of course I haven't. Yeah, don't be ridiculous. uh, Yeah, no, why would you even say that to me? Weird. And like, I had, you know, like my to-go day cup in the console of the car, but, um, someone showed up to pick us up and that was, and that was it. You know, like I had to call my insurance company. Um, I did deal with questions from the kid's school, but compared to what it could have been and like. Some like have kind of learned to make sense of why, like, why, why didn't I have some of the consequences that other people have? Is it like, I think my higher power has allowed me to go through anything that's going to help me be useful to others and has protected me from consequences that would stop me from being useful to others. And, you know, like, if I would have gotten a DUI, if I would have gone to jail, I would have lost my license. Like, I would have been giving all those people rides to meetings when I first got sober. (laughs) You know, I wouldn't have been able to be employed. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, talk about being of service to others. Um, you know, what was the process like for you? Did you go through the traditional 12 steps and meetings and the whole? Yeah, absolutely. So what was your process of finding a sponsor like? Oh, so awkward. Um, <laughs> no, right? know, like, <laughs> awkward. <laughs> so, so awkward. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, the treatment center that I went to was um, definitely 12 step based. Like part of the program is that we had to get a sponsor and begin working the steps within two weeks out of detox. Awesome. Um, and so like we went to community meetings, we had to find a sponsor. Um, <laughs> totally. Honestly, there was a girl and I thought she had a pretty mouth um, and she said some cool shit. And I'm like, do you want me my sponsor? You. And, uh, you know, and she said, yes. And so, and she, Marino, like she set a clear intention. She's like, we're going to get you as far as we can in the steps before you go back home. Oh, and, nice. um, you know, it's like I came home thinking I'm going to start about making my amends. Um, <laughs> no. And then I got high again. <laughs> oh. um, you know, and so then after the relapse, like finding a sponsor on my own accord um, was really a matter of like being at a women's meeting and finally feeling like safe enough to tell mm. them like, I can't, I can't stop drinking. And I already went to treatment and I already got all the awareness and, um, and there was people Self that knowledge them. avails us nothing. I know. Self knowledge. Yeah. And so I found someone and I asked her, and you know, like I did the whole game in my head, like she's younger than me. Can I trust her? But she's been sober longer, so that sort of makes her like older in sobriety time. Had a and, head game. Um, yeah, and ultimately she was amazing, and that <laughs> was you know, and that uh, that became my home group. Um, so did you say it was a day. women's meeting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love women's meetings. Mm-hmm. And you know, yeah. it's funny, like when I first heard, like, you should go to women's meetings, all I heard was, you're a slut. <laughs> like, that's oh. what my brain, you, know, huh. you shouldn't be around in all that youth group stuff, all that, like, <laughs> women are tempstress and all those things. You're like, women's meetings are great. I'm like, oh, no, I'm sitting by men. Like, you can't tell me what to do. Mm. And I finally, like, went to a women's meeting and felt that thing that that is not duplicatable for me anywhere else. It's not. Oh, they weren't being mean. They were trying to help me. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a, um, nurturing, loving, cozy, safe feeling that I get at women's meetings when women are on your side, because listen, mm-hmm. I mean, in all fairness, 
women had the, I think we've all had the experience of being around the mean girls, right? There's a movie about it for heaven's sakes, right? And, and every, and it became so popular because everyone's like, all the women are like, yeah, totally understand. That's like junior high mean girl thing. Um, right. However, when we band together and we, we, I mean, women, women love so fiercely that we will band together and we are resourceful. We band together and magical things happen. We are, Absolutely. And I our think DNA, our DNA is, you know, we're, we're designed to be in a community to protect each other and help each other out. And I think like that the, um, just the shares and the authenticity mm-hmm. in a strictly women's meeting is so different that it gave me the courage to be that, like to be oh, vulnerable yeah. and oh. to be, you know, imperfect and, and not feel the shame that I had in other places. Absolutely. And and just a side note, I know there's men out there listening. Mark's probably losing his shit right now. <laughs> Men's <laughs> meetings are awesome too. Yes. Yes. Same gender. Me- like my husband only goes to uh, men's meetings because of the same thing. There's something about being in the in the room with the opposite sex that changes the dynamic. It's not right or wrong. I, I love, I love mixed meetings. My, my podcast is named after a mixed meeting in my, my hometown. And that was super amazing, but that's not always the case. And I think that, you know, the other addiction that goes along with alcoholism and addiction is love, sex and love addiction. Right. And, Absolutely. You know, we are not, you know, <laughs> they say like, if you want to date me, a that, uh, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why they say you shouldn't date your first year. It's because you're spending a bunch of time with people that are in recovery that are not all there. <laughs> well, and like that's the things. Like I realized, like the the alcoholic part of my brain, like was working way before I ever found drugs. You know. Oh yeah. And like I mean. I could use a dude to get out of myself just as quick as a drink, you know, like mm-hmm. shoplifting, self-harm, like any of those things, mm. you know, like, like met the need of being louder than my head until it stopped working. Oh, and yeah. eventually that landed me, you know, with like, with drinking and using. Yeah. The self-harm stuff, was that like a, it seems to be very typical in a um, junior high, high school age. Did that happen after your sexual assault? That's when it first started happening. Um, yeah. And then in the, there was a long period of time that it, that wasn't something I did. And then after my divorce, it began again. Was it like and, cutting? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And like adults with, with weird cut marks. And it was not like, um, it wasn't like a repetitive cutter. Yeah. Like it, it was, um, it was a lot more, let's see if this will kill me cutting. And oh, so those things show up on an adult, like in a doctor's or a hospital, you know, yeah. um, the questions became a lot more direct. And, mm-hmm. and I realized like, this is, this is not like playing around in junior high. Um, so when you, you know, say like, the questions become more direct, I think this is really important to note. Uh, a coaching client of mine was like, um, it was, somebody asked me, do you have plans to kill yourself? Like nobody asks that question. Mm-hmm. I think it's an important question just to ask, do you plan to kill yourself? Do you have a plan to kill yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Those are very direct questions that people don't ask very often. Right. Well, and like what I, what my experience was, and I was grateful for it at the time, um, especially like interacting like with patients or the public or like people in a very like brief, you know, like not relationship. Um, they were very quick to offer uh, a, a possible explanation for, and they'd be like, oh my gosh, did that happen gardening? Yes. <gasps> yes, it did. Um, you know, one person said something about like, oh, I, I did that same thing to my arm on a fence. Yeah, that fence. Mm-hmm. And it, I was so relieved that they were willing to fill in the blank. Oh, my goodness. And then there was a couple of people who were not. And they were just like, what are you doing? You know, it was not a direct question. Like, you know, do you mm-hmm. have plans to kill yourself? Um, but more like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing to yourself? Yeah. And um, so accusatory. I mean, hopefully they said it with empathy. <laughs> I mean, I think um, people I, get scared, right? That's what I say. I think that people were really scared. I think people were just scared of yeah. me for me, you know, yeah, how to yeah. be around me. Right. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Look how far you've come. Um, so, okay. 
So have you, through the trauma-informed therapy, were you able to, do you feel like now the sexual assault is, does that still trigger you? Do you feel, are you still in the process of resolving? Like, did you do like EMDR or is it talk therapy? What kinds of things did you do to resolve or? Um, I have not done EMDR. It's fucking fabulous, by the way. It's so good. No MDR yet? Oh, I lost your audio. Can you hear me? Can you still hear me? <laughs> Fucking technology. I wonder how much of this is going to make it. Oh, oh okay. you're back. Okay. <laughs> Fucking technology. I'm so sick of the internet. <laughs> I mean, such a um, blessing and a curse. Okay, so you were saying no MDR yet? No, I have not done oh that God, yet. It's so good. You have to try it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like the opposite of a drug dealer. I'm like a therapy dealer. I'm like, you have to try yeah. MDR. <laughs> when I think like really the beginning of like what was genuinely like healing for me was like um, in treatment, we had to write our autobiography. Oh, yeah. Um, and between writing my autobiography and it happened to work out there at the same time I was working the fourth step with that first sponsor. Oof, big. It was the first time that I ever told my story from my perspective. Mm. Um, oh, your audio cut out. I don't have audio. I don't have audio. <laughs> no. Uh, this is going to be fun to edit. I'm sure it'll come back. And, oh, there we go. I should, this is going to be fun to edit. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, Okay, so like with the sexual assault, what was more upsetting, difficult is that um, my extended family defended him. That's Um, typically what happens. And people from um, the church took a really like, we're not getting involved in this. So like this person continued to show up to church. Um, We had to continue to be in like the same area. And it became really, really confusing. Um, And you were 14? I was 13. Oh, 13. How old was he? Uh, 27. Oh, my God. And, um, you know, like, and this is just, like, the truth of it. And, like, you know, I guess I realize I still have shame because I still, like, feel, ugh, like, talking about it yeah. or calling it for what it is. But, like, the facts around it is that it was a cousin-in-law and my cousin, who I adored, um, was dying of cancer. Oh and God. he babysat us. Um, on a Father's Day Sunday so my parents could go out and he spent six hours doing horrible things. Um, and and literally less than a week later, my cousin died um, without ever being told what had happened. And so we dealt with her funeral. Um, Everybody felt sorry for him. Yeah, people felt sorry for him. There was accusations that because I looked like her, he couldn't help himself. <gasps> um, I was, you know, like required to sit with the entire family at her funeral. Oh my God. Sitting with him. So all of that became so confusing, like that I just could not make sense of what was happening. And um, there really wasn't the space or I don't know. The first time I was able to look at that with some outside people was in treatment and really being validated that like, that behavior from those adults was sick, like that you really, really were innocent and worth protecting. I needed to hear that to be able to begin to heal. Oh my God, that is the craziest thing ever. Are you still there? Yeah, I am. Oh, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh shit, not again. Um, yeah, okay, so yeah, the validation and acknowledgement is huge as a beginning to process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would highly recommend EMDR, it's amazing. I, I mean, and this, and this is me at 26 years of sobriety, I didn't do it till just recently, but I'm, yeah. now I'm like, wow, why did I wait so long? You know, mm-hmm. and there's this idea of like optimal recovery, it's like just because you and I'm sure you've seen this a lot in the rooms, um, just because you haven't drank or used in a long time and you've been through the steps doesn't mean that there's not more work to be done. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've seen people who are like, well, I haven't drank for a year, so I don't need to do the steps. Well, you still are carrying around unprocessed experiences. How about we process those so that you're not, I think most people just grow accustomed to their pain. They they become Mm -hmm. tolerant of it. 
Um, you know, that's one thing I think that sobriety has like given me is like um, a way lower pain tolerance. Yes. Um, which is appropriate. That I, yeah. That I cannot sit in discomfort without medicating it. And if I've agreed not to medicate it, then I have to address it. Right. Um, and they get that people who don't have my problem don't need my solution because I get judgy or frustrated. Like why, why are other people able to have a different path or go a different route or, you know, do less work, um, you know, and not go back. And I'm like, for what, uh, you know, like I have to do what I have to do to stay well. And sometimes that looks different for other people. Yes. You know, stay in your own line, right? We just have to stay focused on our own. Sorry, do you hear my dog barking? It's been one of those Hi. days. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> he was outside my door whining a second ago. Um, yeah, super highly produced podcast. <laughs> Not at all. Well, listen, your story is just amazing. Um, and it's, I'm, you know, your voice is so needed. And I'm, and I'm grateful that you're on this path to, you know, with, with school and with your, it's like, you were always a healer. You're in the healthcare industry. So it sounds like you, and you've come from a family of like, you know, I think the message behind, you know, religion, it's like this desire, this calling to help, like we call it a calling in the religious community, right? Yeah. This calling to help lead people out of suffering. Right. And so it's been a part of your DNA your entire life and you've always done it. And that there is, you know, we have to put the oxygen mask on ourselves first before we can be useful to others. And you're doing the work. It's so hard. It can be so hard, but wouldn't you say it's worth it? Oh my goodness. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, people say like a life beyond their wildest dreams. You know, when I took that vote, like that, maybe, maybe my vote counts too. Yeah. Um, I never imagined Ever, I'm. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm so glad God does not give me what I ask for, because I would have shortchanged myself over and over. And like this, this life and who I get to be today, yeah. I could have never pictured. Yeah. And how are your kids doing now? They're amazing. They're yeah. incredible kids now. Like they're meeting babies, you know. So yeah, like yeah. they have um, like a knowledge that not a lot of kids their age possess. Thank God. But I don't think that it, I don't think that it's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, like I've since I met a partner in recovery, um, mm-hmm. you know, and we um, he he came into the relationship being a single dad. Um, so, you know, like we both became step parents in this oh, wow. and it has been it's been amazing. It's a lot of work and it is like it's craziness. It's, you know, like two addicts trying to be sober, living together, raising kids. Like, so they're like, we're nuts, but, um, I wouldn't trade it for anything at we, all. We do find a new normal. Right. And there's so much joy in it. It's whatever you focus on expands. Right. And yeah. you, you guys have an understanding of, yeah. you know, the, of how recovery works in a new, a new format for dealing with things like resentment. Right. It's like my husband and yeah. I, we, you know, we, we've been together a long time. So this doesn't happen as often, uh, hardly ever. But in the beginning, it would be like, we'd get in a fight and he'd go off to the men to get straight. And I'd go off mm-hmm. to the women to get tuned up a little. And it sounds like it happens in very different ways. The women are like very loving and understanding and compassionate. And it sounds like the guys are a bunch of ass kickers. <laughs> I'm so glad women don't interact like men because we do like support and build each other up and normalize. And guys are like, you're an idiot and you need to change it. <laughs> yeah. Make the popping sounds. Huh? I used to have this, uh, there was this Southern football coach. He, you know, that was his way of saying, pull your head out of your ass, make the popping sounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Isn't that cute? Uh, yeah. But yeah, but you know, we would go our separate ways and do our separate processes and then come back and, and I would come back owning my stuff and he would come back owning his stuff. And it just takes all the wind out of your sails when you're just like, oh God, I realized I was being such a jerk and how I, you know, being self-centered, self-seeking and only not considering his feelings, um, you know, and being like, wow, I'm really sorry I made you feel that way. And meanwhile, he's doing the same thing and it just melts that resentment, right? Resentment is yeah. like a wedge that gets into relationships. And so, I mean, this is why like we've been able to stay together. I mean, that's a, it's a great way to have, it's like a great foundation for a relationship, having the process of resolving resentment. Yeah. And I mean, and that's very much like the dynamics in our household is like, we each work our own program, yeah. like first and foremost, and then everything else kind of just 
lines itself up. Yeah. Um, you know, but like when, before we started really spending time together, um, you know, I remember telling him, you like, I, I can't have a relationship. I don't know how to be healthy. My sponsor <laughs> won't like this, you know, like giving him all the warnings and, and him saying, you know, like, if I can just be like number three or four on your list, mm, like, mm-hmm. I'm like, what, like, what does that mean? Like, he wants us to see other people too. You know, like, just my thinking was so distorted. Like, what does that mean? And when he said, you know, like, I know that like your program and sobriety has to come first. Yeah. Your kids are always going to come second. Yeah. If I could be like third on the list, that's all that I'm looking for. And like, wow. That- yeah. That is so yeah. healthy. Yeah. I remember my mother in law, when she was a program, you know, Alan, and she would say, it's God first. Then, you know, God first, your recovery, your husband, and then your kids. She like shuffled my, I was all, really? <laughs> my kid, because you always think, oh, your kids should come first above everything, you know? Because if mom's yeah. not right, nothing else will be right. Because mom yeah. ain't happy, nobody happy. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, you are living a beautiful life and a beautiful example of recovery. I'm so happy that. Um, you've made your way out of the seemingly hopeless uh, despair and the, that you gave yourself a vote. That yeah. is genius. It's a stroke of genius. Um, well, I mean, I feel blessed in every single way. And like, I know there's other people that are wondering, like, is it worth it to keep trying? Yeah. Like, do I quit or do I cast my own vote? And like, Everyone says it, but like, if I can do it, it, it can be done. Anyone can find their way out if if they are at that place that they're truly willing to do whatever it takes. Yeah, absolutely. Get help. Yeah, if you're thinking about killing yourself, reach out and ask for help. You have nothing to lose. Yeah. There is always hope. Well, Megan, yeah. Megan Love, I love that your last name is Love. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I'm so grateful to Mark that he connected us. Um, your story has... Ah, filled my heart with um, hope and inspiration. And I just know that your story is going to touch the hearts of others. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. I'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.